I love what you've done here, Robert. It's this deep integration of what was previously disparate activities, uh, previously uh, sort of disparate sources of confusion, because like you say, the moment I need to switch context and go to a different place, you've kind of lost me on that cognitive burden journey. And, and you've deeply integrated so many behavioral parts of um, data modeling and, and data analytics and data maturity. And you've deeply integrated um, so many of the outcomes with the actual workflow of the actual data analytics team in there, like you mentioned, everyday practice. I mean, I just think of the virtuous cycle of benefit that, that comes from uh, adopting this approach because it's a little bit like uh, you know Warren Buffett's compounding interest, right? Mm -hmm. And a data product that begins in this way is going to compound on itself over time with these virtuous benefits that come from having this deep integration as opposed to another data product that's built in a fragmented way that doesn't have that deep integration. Over time, it's going to trend towards entropy and chaos. And one of those two data products is going to be successful and the other one is going to struggle or fail. So here's what we got today. Um, I'm going to be talking about dictionaries, um, but it's going to be a different kind of dictionary. Um, I think a lot of us understand that dictionaries are very useful. Um, we create data dictionaries. We create documentation. Um, we're going to talk about a kind of dictionary today that you can use every day when creating KPI dashboards and reports. I'm really excited okay. about this. Okay, me too. Yeah, let's dive in. And we've spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about the definitions of different terminology. Now we're going to talk about the definitions of how do we measure things in an organization. Um, and it's a reference material. My argument here is that we can create a lot of reference material and we can we can we can build these points of reference and put them in different systems, but that point of reference is completely useful useless if it's too invisible or too obscure, if it's too hard to find. Maybe it sits in a company knowledge base, maybe it sits in um a network folder, maybe we even link to it from our dashboards, but there are different ways that we can obscure that reference material. And so all the time that we spend writing these things down and making sure that we're very precise about the definitions and the business logic and all those things that go into data documentation, um, no one's going to use it if it's too hard to find. So we're going to talk about everyday KPIs and, and specifically something that I call a KPI glossary. This is inspired by Noah Webster. He, he created uh, the first dictionary in uh, America, right? And so today we kind of joke about the differences between how we spell things between American English and British English. Um, do, does color include a U before the, the R? Mm -hmm. And how do we spell data visualization? Is it with, a, an, with S an S or, or a Z? Z or a Z for our friends in, in Australia, right? Um, but at the time, when he created this American Dictionary, um, people were spelling things differently, not just between America and the British, but among all different, all different states, all different colonies. Mm -hmm. um, everybody was doing things a little bit differently. And we run into the same kind of things when we're dealing with uh, reporting and analytics. Um, different parts of the organization define things differently. They measure things um, that include this or that, um, exclude this or that. And there's a need for a, a standard way of, of measuring things. And that's where data dictionaries come in. That's where this particular concept we're talking about today is going to come in. But I'm going to propose something that we, that we can use um, a little bit differently that's, uh, I think, more useful than uh, the 
traditional, typical approach to um, standardizing the definition of metrics. So the basic problem here is that we have a set of things that um, are our data warehouses, our analytics tools, maybe visualization, maybe um, code in our data science tools. And then we've got our, our documentation in a totally separate place, some kind of knowledge repository. It could be some kind of note-taking system. It could be some kind of file repository, anything that your company might use as a knowledge base. But that knowledge base typically is, is more of a document format. It doesn't mesh well. It doesn't merge well with our data systems. So, so how, do we, how do we actually make that accessible when we're building a report? Um, have, have you guys run into this problem before? Yeah, I mean, myself, I was running a, a glossary of acronyms in the organization that I work in, which was super long, super large. Um, but it was on a shared drive and only tribal people knew where it was. And um, I probably have all of the acronyms in there, but I believe it's likely not being used because it's obscure. Mm -hmm. And then um, in terms of glossary and dictionary, we actually, um, you know, have attempted to use some of these more expensive uh, data dictionary tools. And I've struggled with those because they have you, like Calibra, for example, cataloging tools. You know, they have you going around after the fact, trying to look at what happened. And sort of like, I picture it like chasing the dog around the park with a little baggie trying to pick up after it, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, and I think what you're getting at here, Robert, is that we need to meet the user in their workflow. Yeah. And we need to be present in the moment when the analyst is, is assembling the things and have everybody kind of working in the glossary, working in the dictionary as a part of their day-to-day -day life. Yeah. So the basic challenge is if our documentation is in a different place than where we're doing the reporting and analytics. It's hard to find. Mm -hmm. So here's how I think we make that easier, is that we convert those reference documents into a reference table. We structure it in such a way that we can actually insert that into the database and, and do an inner join. That's what this diagram is showing. It's actually an inner join or a left join with um, the analysis that we're doing, with the KPIs that we're trying to measure. So that's what we're gonna go through today. What does that look like? How can we use it? How can this help us um, create KPI reports um, with inline documentation? Mm. Not just documentation, but something that makes our KPIs way more useful. It starts with something really, really basic, and that is structuring our data in such a way where we're pivoting the measure names from, from those columnar values where every metric is its own column to um, you know, pivoting that so that the KPIs are, are listed in rows. When we do that in our data, then we can join it with something like this, where we've got the KPI name and the KPI ID in a glossary file. And we can take that metric, join it up based on that ID as, as our database join key. It has no spaces, no special characters. It's useful as a join key. And then that name can be whatever we want and, and we can change it. We can make a long version and a short version, depending on how we want to display it. Um, that's where it starts. It is, is structuring it in such a way that we've got this measure names, and measure values thing in a columnar structure. Everything else we're going to do keys off of that. The one um, thing that we've just done, because my colleagues on, on the performance dashboard that I'm working on will recognize this structure. We've got program IDs, metric IDs, KPI IDs. And for us, there's a difference between a KPI ID and a metric. A KPI and a metric are different things. Um, the, one, the one thing that we're doing is we're making those IDs numeric mm. so mm -hmm. that when they get up in Tableau and when we're doing computation on them in Tableau, that the dashboard will run faster on that numeric yeah. value instead of a string. I've, I've used both in that way, that the, 
the numeric IDs are helpful for like faster joins and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then when I'm wanting to filter for certain ones, sometimes it's easier to just use those short names mm -hmm. or the short names and calculations. Because once that get that sure. list gets above a dozen or two, then it's really hard to remember, do I need KPI 23, 24, 25? Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, I can always remember CSAT, yeah. like those, mm -hmm. those words sure. will stick in my head. Yep. Right. Yeah, we'll talk about that. That's, that's one of those KPIs that we're going to talk about here and, and how mm -hmm. do we define those aggregations and such. So once we have that basic structure, the next thing we need is a description. And at first, um, the, the way that I used this was, was fairly simple. It was just so that we can put that description inside of tooltips, other kind of description, descriptive features inside of a dashboard or report. Um, so that it's just there. Um, and, and when you've got that in a database driven way, um, if we wanted to change that description, um, modify the business logic, change the way that we um, explain that to business users, uh, we've got two options. One is you change every worksheet manually and go in and click in every worksheet and every <laughs> tool tip and retype it all. Um, and frankly, that's just not going to happen. It's too much work. It's too much maintenance. And, and it just doesn't stay up to date. But if we can do this in a central location in the database, in a table, uh, then we, we change this glossary file and it, and it updates throughout. The second thing, though, and this is this is really setting us up for the future of um, AI in in data analytics. I've talked a lot about how, in order for AI to be effective in the world of data, we have to teach the algorithm what does this metric mean, how do we describe it, um, and and I think this is how we do that. Um, we have a natural language description of this metric that is, um, that's the training set that mm. goes into the, the chat bots that we're inevitably going to use in the future to try to understand what's going on in our business. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. And it, I think that Robert, that also points to this piece of once we have this abstraction of we're not just adding more columns to our data for gross sales, net sales, east sales, west sales, and so on, that we're adding these new rows for new KPIs. Mm -hmm. And then those rows have their own attributes. We're right. adding more attributes as we need to to help explain things more. So who's the right. owner um, and so on? What's the the date that this KPI was established, et cetera, et cetera, et right. cetera. That's just a little bit of data to add that can be mm -hmm. so useful for yeah. so many different needs, including the AI piece. And again, because it's accessible right there in the database, right there in the dashboard, I don't have to go to some other system, some other link, another browser tab, another window, what have you, in order to figure those things out. It can just be right there as I'm looking at the number in the dashboard. It keeps me in my workflow. And one mm -hmm. of the other things that um, I've been thinking a lot about recently is, well, there was a post from Bethany Lyons where she says, everybody gets it wrong that technologists need to learn more about the business. Mm. She says, no, no, no. The business people need to learn more about technology. And, and one of the ways that we can help them to do that because they're all good people, these business persons that just would like to understand if they could, if they had the time, if it was, if it was more understandable. What we do here is we bring their world into our world. Mm -hmm. And then when the technologists and the business persons who are less technical are meeting over topics, those conversations are also happening just in one place. And so it's not as if you go to have a, a, a conversation with the, the business team over the glossary, but the rest of the data model is absent from the conversation. 
It's like it's like you you, you begin to mm. bring everything and integrate everything into just one place where all of the team members, each with their specialties and their, and their differing spectrums of technical awareness, nevertheless are conversing and having this dialogical learning process over the data model. Yeah, I find that's really that kind of conversation really needs to happen. And it gets, I was just involved last week in a, a KPI process where some of the definitions that we were having, like what is the definition of country that we're using in our two KPIs actually mm -hmm. using the same definition of country yeah. between them. It, it really helps surface those things yeah. at a stage when it's much easier to do something about it than way downstream when the data is on a dashboard already. So, so yeah. far with just a couple of fields in a database table, we've talked about things that are incredibly useful, um, just mm -hmm. all by themselves. I love the, I gotta say, I love the gray boxes in this presentation on the, the right hand side of the screen that are saying there's more. There um, is more. Yeah. There's lots more really enjoying uh, that we're going to talk about that I'm really excited about because this is how it translates into something that's not just useful for the person looking at uh, a report with all these KPIs in them. It's actually really useful for the person building the report and trying to handle all these different ways of measuring things because not everything's measured the same way. Um, and, and they're not all using the same units. They're not all in the same categories. So, so let's just go from, from the names and descriptions and talk about, um, first of all, there are different business groups who are going to be measuring these things. There might be the sales group, the operations group, customer service, what have you. And it's necessary to group those things because... Um, either you just want to collect them in, in a tabular structure on a report or you want them in their own um, views um, so that you, you can customize things based on the audience. Um, but they're also measuring different units. Some are dollars, some are percentages, some are um, units of time. And, and you know, I've, I've come across so many different units of measure <laughs> in, in my career of, of analytics. Um, that I think it's really important to actually have something that says, to what degree do we measure this thing? Um, and, and this offers a way of defining that as well. But it's more than just defining it. I wanna go back to a previous episode where we talked about mm -hmm. the structure of bands, those big aggregate numbers, and how do we construct those in the visualization? Um, because we might have a dollar sign or an up down arrow in front of it, or we might have um, millions or percentage or a unit of time at the at the uh, right hand side of that band. And so this this KPI glossary can actually define what is the string that we want to put as the prefix, um, and then we're we're going to have our our aggregate measure. And then we're going to have what is the string that we want as the suffix, right? Those are things that we can all do in a data-driven way with this KPI glossary. It's a very fundamental part of the data structure that makes it easier for the data practitioner to build these reports. And we talked a lot in the uh, introductory episode before this earlier in your um, in your series, Robert, that doing it this way avoids having all of those string computations being done in a big, ugly calculation in Tableau. We have a right. nice, tidy approach where uh, this, the thing not only performs well, but the calculations are easy to read. Um, it just brings it all together. Right. And imagine we have five, 10, a dozen, two dozen different measures. Um, all of a sudden, that, that long if-then calculation now has to look at every one of those measures individually versus just looking mm -hmm. at a reference file. So the other thing that we have to look into is different things are measured in different ways. Some of them require some, some division, some multiplication, some, some unique aggregations. And that's something else that we can define in this KPI glossary. A lot of them are very simple. 
like sales, we just we just want to add those up and and we get the total, right? No big deal. Maybe we want to count customers or or count some kind of individual identifier and that's account distinct. Okay, also, not really that big of a deal. But now if we want to measure how many new customers are we getting on average every month? Well, now we've got kind of uh, an, a level of detail calculation, something a little bit more sophisticated where we first have to get the monthly total, and then we have to average that out across some number of months. And so I've got this numerator aggregation column here um, that it isn't really a, a tableau function. It's just defining, hey, you know, we've got some special thing that we have to refer to knowing that we're going to need some kind of a special calculation logic. And I'll cover that in a, in a later episode of what that logic might look like in Tableau. Um, but, but, but this is where we say um, this KPI is measured this way, this one is measured that way, and so on and so forth. And then we have this distinction between numerators and denominators because if we're just adding things up, the denominator is one, you divide by one, and that's just it. It's a simple aggregation. But sometimes we need an overall average. So, um, you know, if we're looking at social media followers, we're going to look at total uh, or, or social in media engagement rate, sorry. Um, then we're going to look at the total number of engagements divided by the number of impressions or, or number of views on that um, social media post. It's a percentage, it's a ratio. Um, and, and when we're dividing those things, we actually have to have two different fields. We can't do a simple average because averaging an average is a bad idea, <laughs> right? Averaging percentages is a bad idea. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and the same thing is true, Jonathan, you mentioned CSIM. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, for that, you've got to look at um, the total responses versus the, the rating of each response. Mm -hmm. And so there's a numerator and denominator in that calculation. Um, net promoter score is the same kind of a way. Yep. And then I see the target logic at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that the uh, higher is better, lower is better? Right. So if we're comparing a KPI against some goal and we want to color it red or green or yellow or uh, any any sort of scheme that we want to use as this is a good thing or this is not a good thing. We met our goal, we exceeded our goal, we were below our goal, what have you. Well, it's a good thing if sales go up. It's not a good thing if cost goes up, right? So that target logic, that plus and that minus, is just a simple way to say it's it's positive is a, a positive increase, a positive number is is advantageous to our business, and we want to we want to color that a certain way. We want to add a shape that indicates a, a certain um, improvement. Um, Versus negative, which just, it, it flips the sign, right? It says, um, if cost goes up, that's bad. <laughs> um, but then we can also say NA, right? It's neutral for employee count. Well, that's something that we just, we just kind of want to know. We want to keep an eye on. It's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing if we hired more people or lost more people. We just kind of want to keep a feel for um, where that's headed. Um, but we want to, don't want to make any sort of value judgment. There's no sort of benchmark towards it. Um, so it, it offers some flexibility to say, um, what are our thresholds? And most importantly, what direction, the directionality of those thresholds. Right. And I can see again, what you're doing here is, is you're baking all of this stuff into the glossary itself, which is integrated with that inner join to the data itself and managed centrally in one location so that then it can spiral out from there into every worksheet, every dashboard, every analysis. It's all managed in this one place and it spirals out from there. So I'm already just picturing like, how would I approach my standard, consistent, best practice application of the color palette 
to this yeah. plus minus target logic, it gets so much easier when I don't have to make that decision on every worksheet with every mark on the screen. I just know that there's this one computational design pattern that I'm going to use depending upon the target logic, if it's a plus, a minus, or a neutral. Yeah. And I think people who are watching this might be able to begin to imagine their own scenarios that might be a little bit more complex than what we're showing here. Um, I've worked with people that have red, yellow, green thresholds. So it's not just a plus or minus. It's for this KPI, we have this benchmark and 90% uh, would be colored red, 95 would be yellow, and 100 would be green, and, and so on. And so the same structure can be very flexible and useful for more complex scenarios. Or one place, the, the kind of first time I really used this structure, we had, we had kind of the one up down for the target logic, but we had anywhere from zero to four different benchmarks. Mm-hmm that we were doing yeah. and being able to encode all of those benchmarks together in a table format, just let us keep track of which, which benchmarks apply to what and where we don't have them and be able to then generate the views in a much more um, algorithmic way versus huge amounts of calculations. Yeah. Versus having yeah. to go in to calculated field after calculated field um, mm -hmm. in I don't even know how many different workbooks you might have mm -hmm. and edit each one of them. And let's say that executive say, says, um, well, now we're going to change the threshold. How many different places do you have to change that mm -hmm. now um, to just modify you know, next year's targets? And so in terms of analytic maturity, this uh, approach that you've got here, Robert, really propels us further down that analytic maturity uh, path towards mastering um, because we've got now the maintainability of the data model, right? So if we're exactly. going to have if we're going to have kind of an advanced analytics team that sort of uses metrics to to discern and determine and measure ourselves in our own efficacy of data modeling. Then, then one of the metrics that we might use to measure the, the efficacy of our data model is how maintainable is it, right? Exactly. And if the data model has these, these spider web of calculations that are in all kinds of different places, and if the transferability of how that thing functions from one person to the next is extremely difficult, then the maintainability of the data model itself, it can be somewhere between kind of onerous to inept. Mm -hmm. Which means that we're just not that mature as an analytics organization yet because we haven't mastered an approach that enables for the person who built the thing to hand it off then to the subsequent person who's going to take over ownership after that and to have it be all clear and understood and manageable and, um, and not just be an onerous mess of sprawl uh, that is frankly just overwhelming uh, to the person who's going to take it over which ultimately leads to the failure of the data product itself. Exactly right. Yeah. And I'll add one piece to that on the kind of where the organization is in terms of maturity is when you start doing this. And um, I'm going to go back to the helping somebody last week and doing this kind of thing. And we start diving into those details of the numerators and the denominators and what is the availability of the data or how well it's defined taking this time to, when it's one KPI at a time, the, the level of availability of the KPIs can be kind of hidden, but when you're putting everything together in one table, it really starts highlighting, yes, we have this, no, we don't have that, yep. and, and surfaces those issues, which can then make it more clear of, okay, how ready, how ready are we for what part of our our dashboard and analytics we're trying to build. Yep. One of the things you're alluding to here is this language I use constantly with all of the Actionauts is an effective shared reality. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so what this does is this approach gives us an effective shared reality, not just between the technologists and the business persons, but among the technologists handing over a maintainable data model from, from one analyst to the next. But also what you're describing, Jonathan, is an effective shared reality 
about what we do have and what we don't have, mm -hmm. right? And and which along that sort of um, expose, explain, explore, empower um, uh, ecstasy uh, arc mm -hmm. that you've described, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, where are the pieces in our data model that we haven't even yet begun to kind of cable up and instrument mm -hmm. the data collection? So you could have some attributes in your in your glossary here, um, uh, Robert, that could have sort of a self-assessment of the quality of the data, yeah. um, a self-assessment of the timeline at which we expect for that data to become available because it's not available yet today, it's still under construction. Yeah, update that, frequencies, time frames, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that goes mm -hmm. to your earlier slide, Robert, of that the Venn diagram and connecting those pieces. Yeah. That this document serves to help connect these different parts of this data is available, this data is not available. Yeah. As soon as we expect mm -hmm. people to click outside of the dashboard to go and find that, we've lost them. It's mm -hmm. got to be right there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to mention one more thing, though, is where do people go next, right? We're looking at these high-level KPIs. We've talked elsewhere about, you know, these big numbers are great. They give us an overview. But it's really important to, to be able to dig into more details. And very often, in fact, most of the time, we have these high-level metrics that we're measuring there's probably another dashboard that, that gives more detail. Um, it's going to break it down by geography, by business unit, by it's going to have trends based on timelines and, and on and on and on, right? It's lots more details. Um, and we want to make that accessible. The way that we make that accessible is not by saying, well, you know, just type it into the search bar or, or something like that. And, and the fact is, if it's inside the same system, let's say it's, it's in Tableau, then you know that's easy to just maybe put in a link or an action filter or drill down or something like that to another Tableau workbook, but it's not always in Tableau, right? Sometimes it's in a third party system. Sometimes it's in a, a finance system. Sometimes it's in, a very specialized uh, analytical platform where maybe there isn't a Tableau dashboard ready made for that deep dive yet, but we still want to make it accessible. So by putting those links in this KPI glossary, we can say, hey, if you want to find out more, well, you could go to this Tableau workbook that we've built that gives you more, or you can go to, um, this particular page on, on Salesforce or uh, your Oracle system, or your Adobe Analytics or your PeopleSoft or, or on and on and on. All these third-party systems that have their own built-in analytics that are, are, are pretty good out of the box. Let's just give them a hyperlink to that and go straight to that source system. Um, whether or not we've built a, a Tableau dashboard that, that's custom and well-designed and, and what have you. This glossary lets you just define where those places are and makes it easy to get there. And just to set this up a little bit for the future, um, it's not easy to structure the data in such a way that it's going to work with this kind of a design. It takes some data engineering and that's something that um, I'm really looking forward to talking about further on future episodes of the SenseMakers podcast. Um, because, because in order to get these KPIs structured in this way, um, it, you know, it, it, it does take some effort and, and it takes some focused attention on the back end to, uh, to pivot the data, to aggregate these things, to calculate these things efficiently. Ultimately, I think mm -hmm. it does make the data practitioner's job easier. Um, but I really do want to emphasize that this isn't just about making things more efficient for the things that we're doing today. I mm. really do think that creating this kind of a structure inside your data flow in a machine-readable way 
mm. sets us up for this future where um, we're not writing SQL to ask questions of our business data. We're asking a chat bot. Mm -hmm. We've got mm -hmm. to teach that chat bot. What is this metric? How is it calculated? And I think this kind of a structure sets us up to do that. Action Analytics. It's time for